Welcome back to Gold Derby. I'm Christopher Rosen. I'm joined by Joyce Singh. Joyce, it's a wonderful night for Oscar. Oscar, Oscar. He's Again, back. It's back. Billy's back. We're here for Oscars playback, the 2004 Oscars. Um, Earlier than ever. Earlier than ever. Sunday, February 29th, 2004, Leap Day. The 76th annual Oscars took place. Yeah, um, and kind of a foregone conclusion. Uh, Lord of the Rings uh, won 11 Oscars out of 11 okay. nominations. What a sweep. So we'll talk about this, obviously, in much. I, my big takeaway was this will literally never happen again. That was my main takeaway from this. I don't think there'll ever be a consensus agreement on any movie like this again, or well, just a, ex, like a resigned acceptance of a movie in this way ever again. So it it has the biggest perfect sweep because it went 11 for 11. Yes. And the 11 wins tied um, Ben-Hur and Titanic for the most awards, but Ben-Hur and Titanic had losses. Yes. So they didn't have a perfect record. I don't um, think any movie will get this many perfect. I can't, I can, just can't even imagine what well, movie. Well, the, the previous be. record was was a nine, nine for nine by The Last Emperor and Gigi. So, yeah. Um, It's just, I guess like we would still have like, I mean, we still have movies getting double digit nominations, but I think it needs to be like an event like this. It needs to be an or event now. that everyone agrees on that also is just like in a year when there's really no reason to give it to anything else. I, that was my, I was just like, it was just like, it's a perfect confluence, you know, congruence of events basically. And I was just like, I can't imagine uh, this ever happening again. And maybe the early season helped too, if you believe uh, a Harvey Weinstein choice, because that was the big- I don't think the things. calendar at all affected the best picture winner. <laughs> the, the big headlines of this Oscars were A, uh, that they came a month earlier. This is in August yeah. of 2002. Uh, they moved the Oscars from where we, they were in late March. Now, the ceremony before this, as we talked about, was when uh, Chicago won. It was the Harvey Oscars. And that was a, it lost about 10 million viewers almost from the year. Well, before. it also started three days after the war. Three days after the, the war. The, 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 yeah, the ceremony was three days after the war. End of March. Mm -hmm. And uh, movies that people were not maybe, that were okay, like did okay at the box office, but not like Lord of the Rings. And so everybody panicked and they decided to move the Oscars up. And so Harvey at the time, this is in August, already already kind of priming the pump for his future snubs, says, this is just the big studios coming in and legislating things in their favor, said Harvey Weinstein, co-chair of Miramax, that little tiny studio choice with no big conglomerate backing, as you recall. Oh, wait, it's part of Disney. It was at the time. Never mind. Uh, this is a shorter award season. It's going to favor the bigger movies, which means favoring the bigger studios. But then Terry Press, one of Harvey's rivals, this is in August before the ceremony, long before. Uh, but by the time you get to Adam Awards now, they're almost anticlimactic, Miss Press said. Uh, the same people tend to win over and over again. So at time, Oscar time, you've already seen Julie Roberts six times in six different dresses. The Oscars needs to do this to restore their own luster. Yeah, I mean, like there was already discussions and murmurs of the ceremony being moved up like way before they made it official because of all the excessive and aggressive campaigning pioneered by Harvey and all, all the egregious spending, um, especially after the Shakespeare in Love Saving Private Ryan war. Um, and and yeah, like they it is it is a long season now. And I think, you know, since it's been moved up and now like we're sort of just back in March since COVID. But I think people also got used to being it in February for like 17 years, you know? But I kind of, I like it in March um, because I do feel like it is good or, or especially back then, it was good to have more breathing room for certain mm -hmm. films. Like, I don't think Harvey is wrong in saying that like, you know, you need more time. <laughs> to watch things especially you know like since it moved up to february we just had a lot of rubber stamping like i don't think the surprises we had the year before with the pianist like three shocking wins would have happened if the oscars were in february of 2003 no um and then the other issue this year yes was that uh there was a temporary screener ban because the mpaa was trying to curb piracy so then they were just like, ban all screeners. 
this was great, in September. Great, a great idea. Never wrong to just say, this is not working. Let's just ban it. Yeah, always, uh, DVDs and, and VHSs, you know. Yes. You have a VCR still. Yes. Yeah. So, I have uh, right here. and then obviously, um, you know, the, the, the big studios were mad, the independents were mad, like, you know, indie filmmakers, especially too. And then the following month in October, they were just like, okay, um, uh, you can send screeners just to Oscar voters. <laughs> That's it. Like not to any critics awards, not to the Globes, not to SAG, um, just Oscar voters. So, you know, just looking out for the big dogs, you know, the one yeah. percenters. Uh, so that obviously only benefits the big studios. So then the independents, um, they fought back and then they went to court. And then in December, 2003, a judge ruled in favor of the little guy. Right. So, and then it was like screeners for all. And yeah. Um, so this is an article from December 6, 2003 in the New York Times. The headline, Judge Upsets Studios Ban on Film Copies for Critics. Um, and so that many independent filmmakers argue that the ban imposed in September had severely hurt their film's chances of winning awards and other accolades that could help them at the box office because many small film, many small filmmakers rely on big studios to distribute their movies. Uh, they too were bound by the ban on sending out the copies known in the industry as screeners. Judge Michael B. Uh, McCasey of United States District Court in Manhattan said he was persuaded that smaller filmmakers with limited budgets for promoting their work would suffer if their screen screeners were not distributed because so many movies are released towards the end of the year. It is often hard for critics and prize givers to see all of them in theaters, and they have relied on screeners for many years. Quote, plaintiffs have shown they are at risk to suffer losses in revenue as a result of the screener ban, uh, he said. Um, and then he said, uh, the, the major studio's agreement in, to impose a ban violated federal antitrust law. So, and then it like noted like, you know, several tiny movies uh, this, that current year, um, like American Splendor, Sure. from Good Machine, Lost in Translation from Elemental, and 13 from Antidote. And then Jack Valenti, the president and chief executive of the MPAA said uh, he uh, they would appeal. From day one, the screener policy has been about one thing, preserving the future of our industry for filmmakers of all sizes by curtailing piracy. We know without dispute that in the past, screeners have been sources for pirated goods, both domestically and overseas. Um, and then blah, blah, blah. So some independent filmmakers have called the ban a covert way for studios to undermine the efforts of smaller movies to gain awards and other attention, which often mean the difference between financial success and failure for a small film. In court papers, the small filmmakers argued that unless the ban was lifted immediately, quote, critical exposure, momentum, and quote, buzz opportunities, end quote, would be irreparably missed before the Oscars are presented on February 29th. Um, you know, not wrong. I think everybody is maybe right here. Valenti's not wrong either, right? Like this is a but like, it's also like now that like it's like such it's always been a norm and it's like a norm now. It's like it the piracy issue is not really that big of a deal. No, but it was a big deal in the show because I feel like there were multiple references to piracy. Billy yeah, because this was also downloading the, it. Like this was the era, like early two thousands, you know, when like Napster and like LimeWire right. and everything. So that like I get it then, but like now, like, you know, 20 years on, it's like, it's really not right a thing. Or it is, and they're just kind of baking in that it is a pirate. Like yeah, like, is but, but it's also like problem. just capitalism. It's like, you're looking right. out for money and you're not actually caring about the art. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a big topic for Billy. Uh, Billy returns here, I think for the eighth time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it worked, it worked. The show was 15 minutes longer, 3,045 minutes. But more than 10 million people watched compared to the previous year. So it was almost 44 million people tuned in to watch Lord of the Rings win 11 Oscars. Uh, you Joyce know, it was a huge, huge film. It was. Um, I also think, you know, like the previous year probably also went down because the war had just started. I so. think that was a big deal, obviously. And I think the idea of like watching uh, Hollywood people like kind of give each other awards was not maybe like the vibe of the era at the time and then also i do think that the fact those movies were not 
they were all good movies and all of them now would have been like the biggest hits. Like Chicago would have been like Dune basically, right? You know what I mean? It's just it's like, it's a total joke comparing these movies, but like they weren't like, there was no Lord of the Rings there or no like massive. I mean, like, there was a Lord of the Rings there. <laughs> well, not like this though. You know what I mean? You're right. There was two towers, but not like this. And like, they didn't really care about two towers, obviously. And like, it seemed like the audience didn't either. I don't know. Um, I mean, Two Towers was still the top, top movie of 2002, but this is just the coronation of the entire trilogy. Yeah. And I mean, like none of the other, the best picture nominees, like Seabiscuit was the underdog, but that was like not winning, <laughs> you know? And I wouldn't say like Lost in Translation was a massive hit. That was, you know, like in a tour. These are like Master and Commander and Mystic River were like moderate hits. And then like Seabiscuit was a decent yeah. summer, like, an, like counter programming. And then Lost in Translation was like the indie hit. Yeah. It wasn't it. Yeah. Because the, the the biggest movies of the year were Lord of the Rings, Finding Nemo. Yes. Which, you know, would probably be in the top 10 if they had a 10. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. Both Matrixes. Yes. <laughs> and Pirates of the Caribbean. Right. You know? So... Again, this was a decent a decent year, Joyce. We usually do a 2000 TK in film, 2003 in film. I was looking through, I'm like, this is this is the best year of these so far that we've done, I would argue. Certainly compared to, like, 2001 and 2002, both of which I thought were meh. They're kind of, they're still, like, the same to me. Like, there's just a lot of films I love and I watch over and over again, and then others I have not seen again. So I got, here's, I wrote down a ton uh city of god obviously we'll talk about that was a good one i didn't see that in the theater but i did see it and i enjoyed yeah, it that was a what one of like harvey's victories that he really hung his hat on especially after the cold mountain best picture yes. so. we'll talk talk about that obviously uh x2 x-men sequel love x2 x2 is the best of the uh you know brian singer canceled trilogy obviously or actually yeah. like a uh, quadrally um because he came back later yeah, but past. yeah x2 uh the best one i saw that opening night it was Same. packed um and brian cox amazing a striker and i you know since succession took off it's really upsetting that no one talks to him about x2 no they're too busy asking him if he's watched uh episodes if he's watched logan yeah, he's watched connor's wedding and it's how many like, times do i got to hear that stop asking him he doesn't like to watch himself which is right. fine a lot of actors don't like to watch himself it's, ask about x2 i think they're asking it so they could get the headline that's like basically like makes it seem like brian cox doesn't like success yeah because that's like the you know the narrative that people have to paint of him that Obviously. he's just like i mean he is a curmudgeon but it's like they they want to make it seem like he is logan roy yes yeah uh other ones i wrote down uh matrix reloaded and like you said, the other Matrix, boy, Revolutions. Revolutions, one of the most, this this is like Phantom Menace level disappointment for me. I know that and like now people have like maybe reevaluated these Matrix sequels and like gonna say they're great. I don't know about that. I don't, I'm not ready to go there. I, I, mean, I mean, I haven't seen them again and they were like, whatever. And I, I, I think compare the quality difference between to me, the Matrix, which I think is like an amazing movie and really holds up and Matrix Reloaded and Revolutions was just like, like this, a direct, like down. Reloaded is definitely better than Revolutions. Uh, and Revolutions is better than the fourth one that came out a couple of years Never ago. Just a tough, tough look. I, I just was not into these. But I even recently seen like action scenes from Reloaded going viral because they're like, this is the greatest action. And I'm like, it was, I guess. I don't know. I don't think these are, these were not, I'm not on the. It uh, also like doesn't really have much of like a, a cultural footprint, even like culty wise you know like i don't know it's like like i know you know obviously the fourth one came out a couple of years ago but it's like no one talks about these two really even to reevaluate them like oh we were too harsh back then i i see i mean maybe i'm like in a weird corner a film twitter but i do see people try to like stump for these but not i uh other other big hits this year bruce almighty jim carrey totally fine finding nemo love it great movie I saw that um, the day after my prom. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. That's good. Good prom movie. Uh -huh. uh, another, a Too Fast, Too Furious choice. One of the four Fast and Furious films I've seen. A uh, Hulk before Marvel Hulk? Ang Lee Hulk. Ang Lee Hulk? Yeah. And it, this it, was a tough one for him. Like Eric Bana? Yeah. yeah this, I will this say this is another one that I think 
not necessarily has been reevaluated, but I do think the way Ang Lee presented the comic and like popped it out to look like comic book pages is something that people now appreciate more than maybe they did then when this movie. Yeah, because it was like 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 floppy back yeah. then. Oh yeah. yeah, and like it really, um, like he's talked about it, like how like that that hurt that it wasn't like as successful as is expected to be this is a great era for movies and i guess to me it's just like now all these properties and these ips are just like obviously like really held tightly but here like that ang lee is able to just make a crazy ass hulk movie it's just awesome like it's another thing we'll never see again i feel like you're never going to be like here's a great comic property that we could mine for ip but you know what uh fancy auteur who's an oscar well uh, no i think the reaction to it is also different now and maybe that's just because of social media but i remember back then and obviously like the the news or the reaction whatever would just be like online or like message boards if you frequent those which i did not but it was just like ang lee is gonna direct hulk right and it's like you know crashing tiger hidden dragons like yeah. ang lee. and i was like oh that's cool and like i guess there was like kind of a sentiment that like oh he's like leveled up to get this like huge comic book ip but now i feel like whenever you have you know like barry jenkins doing like lion king yeah um like people are upset that he's like selling his soul to do this or or uh we, we saw recently uh sarah polly doing bambi. yeah bambi yeah it's like the same thing it's like it's like people are disappointed it's like they're they're not they feel like they're losing their voice it's like no maybe like you don't know why they want to do this like they obviously have a good reason like maybe they can like put their own voice into this property you know uh this is a big sequel summer uh charlie's angels 2 full throttle fine legally blonde 2 red white and blonde not the best terminator 3 rise of the machines i did not see that in the theaters i don't even know when i saw that one uh and my personal favorite of these ride or die bad boys 2 absolutely fuck yes this movie rules i haven't seen that in a really long time oh my god it's so good michael bay un, un unleashed uh will and, and martin dominating michael shannon an early michael shannon uh playing like a, a a racist uh guy who's in i guess like wrapped up in their life or something in the beginning just a great movie uh dan marino i believe has a cameo in it joyce like it's like ace ventura dan yeah. marino should definitely we're, get this we're car. in the 90s Again, Dan Marino should definitely get this car. Not this car. He's going to fuck this car up. But he should definitely get this car. That's like a great, just a great. Will, Will was so good in this. This is good. And uh, so those are the sequels. Pirates of the Caribbean, Joyce. Big fan of that. That was incredible. And that's the best one. Um, You forgot the other three goal of the year, American Wedding. Yes. I was not as big into American Wedding. I kind of went back into the American Pie franchise for American Reunion, which I really enjoyed. I've never seen that one really quite good and the, the nostalgia is good because when you're an old person you're like oh look at that you know how i feel about like once um like a, a series of movies are done and then like 15 years later they do another one and i'm like sure. i don't i don't really want you're out no yeah, legacy no legacy quote for you no. uh pirates is great i i'm not can't say i've revisited it and not sure i will recent for obviously reasons probably but uh i think the franchise was just destroyed by the previous uh, by the future entries which i think are all really bad but this one is great and then obviously you got the johnny depp of it all but still great movie <laughs> was it's, so much fun it's the best one of i think i've only seen three yeah i've only seen three of them i, oh, I man, told so you good. like because the sequel dead man's chest was 2006 and i told you i couldn't see that one in theater with my friends because i got my wisdom teeth pulled right that day yeah, but the first one is, is the best one. So good. Uh, other ones, we mentioned Sea Biscuit. This is when, like, studios were releasing, like, this is like the Oppenheimer spot. Another similarly universal film, I believe, Sea Biscuit, And it's like, here's our adult drama. It, it, was, it was the the underdog, the underhorse. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, it was just, it was like a word of mouth hit. And that was the one people were rooting for to get into Best Picture by the end of the season. And it did it. Yeah. So. Uh, Freaky Friday. Great JLC performance. Lindsay Lohan, they're trying to get a sequel now to happen. So sure. See you there. Uh, you mentioned American Splendor, Lost in Translation, which we'll talk about a lot. Saw that, uh, saw that and Once Upon a Time in Mexico on the same day at Lincoln Square. I believe we bought a ticket, my buddy Chris and I, for Once Upon a Time in Mexico and then snuck into Lost in Translation. Or maybe the other way. Might have been the other way because I remember sitting like front row for Once Upon a Time in Mexico, which was Johnny Depp's other movie in his big year. And I loved uh, obviously Robert, Robert, Rodriguez. Robert Rodriguez. Yeah, love Robert Rodriguez. Love this franchise. Desperado was such a great movie. And then I was like, oh, once time in New Mexico. And I rewatched it last year. And uh, it's not a good movie. 
at all. But uh, I, I have not. Like, once again, I have not seen that in probably 20 years. Uh, and Lost in Translation, absolutely love. That was like one of my favorites. And and I haven't seen it in a long time, but I feel like I would still really like it. I, I think it's, it's. I haven't watched that in a while either, but I've seen it more than once. Uh, School of Rock. Great film. Great Jack Black performance. That was uh, filmed uh, close to me. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. On Long Island. So uh this is a great year for comedy performances. We'll talk about this in Best Actor. I think you could make a strong case for Jack Black and also yeah. Will Ferrell he, and Elf. He got a he got a Golden Globe nomination, yes. Jack. Yeah, and Elf Will, was great. Will Ferrell and Elf, another amazing performance, a lead actor performance that would have not gotten nominated, uh, but should have. Uh Kill Bill Volume One Joyce, absolutely love this movie. And I remember seeing it in theater. And the it ends on a cliffhanger, and it's the fucking best. It's so good. I I prefer this one. To Same too. I I've seen this one like a lot. I I have not really volume two. I find like is totally fine and good, but it's not to me like volume one is like the best. It's so rewatchable, and I've seen it like probably three times as many times as I've seen volume two. Like I'll just watch volume one and not have to watch volume two. I. It's funny because like, yeah, it does. It's like a cliffhanger, right? Into like two. And I feel like the reactions now to like Spider-Verse is like a cliffhanger <laughs> for the third one. It's like, like people are acting like this is the first time it's happened in movies. <laughs> I will say the difference of differences a little bit is that I didn't had I mean, kill I mean, a different time, but I was like, I had no idea that that, I knew it was going to be two parts. But I didn't like the fact that the twist is that she her daughter is still alive. I just did not uh, did not see coming. You didn't I, see coming. Yeah, I did not did not see that coming. Me and uh, quick. You're slip. not one step ahead of Quentin. Holy cow! This movie rules, and it I'm honestly like one of his best. Like I just think it's so like top to bottom one of his best movies. I would actually put this in like my top three of Tarantino, probably Volume One, not Volume Two. Um, do you think it should have been two? I think they could have done it as one movie, probably. Yeah. And I think he's always teased that he would put them together as one, right? Like, I don't think he's yeah. actually done that. Um, and he considers it one movie because we're still doing that fake ass, like 10 movies in a mouth thing, but he's already yeah. got 10 movies. So uh, this is still counts as one movie, but it's this kind is of the like better when movie. People, people ask like, oh, what are your top five movies or whatever? And it's like, do I count the Mighty Ducks trilogy as one? I think in or that like case you could. Three different movies. No, I think you count it as one. Uh, Mystic River, which we'll talk about, which I rewatched it right before we did this. I was not a fan of this movie at the time. Now I love it. Uh, I loved it so much. Uh, other ones I wrote down. Matrix, we said, Elf, Love Actually, Joyce. I love Love Actually. I saw that opening day. Um, so this was my freshman year of college. So I went with my friends. And then um, you, get, you get a student discount if you show your school ID. So sure. I saw it for $3. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to shade Love Act. This is a great movie. I don't care. I'm pretty sure people are like, there, there was like there a time. Are, yeah, now, nowadays, like people take issue with a lot of things in the movie, but I'm like, it's, it's a great cute. movie. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Uh, everyone in it is great. We'll talk about Bill Nye, I'm sure. Should have been an Oscar After winner. winner Bill Nye. Uh, Master and Commander, which I remember seeing in the theater and being like, you know, I'm. that's another one I think film Twitter really loves now. It's a good movie. And I feel like it would have gone, I mean, it did win oscars like yes. in categories without lord of the rings yes <laughs> but uh, it, it would have done better without lord of the rings there definitely uh 21 grams um good i don't really care about it i just it's like it's like you know a drama it was one about it <laughs> i remember having this i felt like obligated to see it when saw it by myself uh never saw it again it felt like yeah, a I haven't seen it movie. again. Yeah, but it was just like when I saw those performances, I'm like, oh yeah, like it, they're getting nominations. Uh, the movie Bad Santa, uh, the to the cap great the trio Bob of great Mormon. comic performances. Billy Bob rules. It's so good. Uh, Last Samurai, Tom Cruise. Don't really care about it. Saw it. Can't say I care about it either. Uh, something's got to give. Diane and Jack. Love something's got to give. I love the ad. It just said Jack and Diane. Like great, great, great marketing. Uh, Mona Lisa smile. That was a big one uh, for Julia Roberts. Um, so and it uh, did not really. I had high expectations, but uh, didn't really do that well. Not got great. Mixed. No, it's like totally mid. You know, Julia uh, Stiles, Kirsten Dunst. Yeah. You know. Big Fish, which I was psyched about because there was an Eddie Vedder song in it, I believe. 
Um, I liked Big Fish, but I have not thought about that movie in a really long time. I keep like flirting with the idea of rewatching it because I'm like, it feels like I would like it. Yeah, I mean, I haven't rewatched it since then, probably. And then Cold Mountain. Those are the ones I wrote down. Those I have not rewatched that either. I kind of want to, though. Did you see The Cat in the Hat? Because I saw that in the theaters. No, that was a hard out. I'm not doing that. Bad. Yeah. Um, Shattered Glass. Yeah, I, that's fine. I know people like that movie. That's fine. Hayden Christensen. Peter um, yeah. Um, the Station Agent. Yes. Very popular indie pick this year. Mm-hmm. Um, did well at SAG. Um, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which came out like five days after Pirates. Yes. Got really swallowed up, but that was like Sean Connery. Yes. Trying to do IP. This was a great era for Connery. We'll talk about this when we get into the ceremony. He opens the ceremony. Yeah. The previous year, he was there to give out Catherine Zeta Jones' Oscar. I'm like, wow, like Connery, they were really like, that was like the last gasp of Connery as like a presence in Hollywood, it felt like, is like this era. Mm-hmm. Um, Obviously, Whale Rider. Yeah. Um, Hollywood Homicide, Harrison Ford, Josh Hartnett. Recently in the news, because Josh Hartnett was like, we actually did get along. And I'm yeah. like, nobody gives a shit. Yeah. But <laughs> also, like, it's just, I, I love that, like, people just, because people, again, it's kind of like the Brian Cox thing, because it's like Harrison Ford is like a curmudgeon. So you just think he hates everything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that movie was not great. Um, I did not see this one, but from Justin to Kelly, huge flop. Didn't see it. Was yeah. a big flop. Not great, Bob. Um, Italian job. Fun. Not a fan. It was fun. Um, but I have not watched that in a while. Um, SWAT. This was a big year for Colin Farrell. Yes. He started a year with the recruit. Yes. That was that the the headlines. I, I like the recruit, but like the press coverage of that movie um was basically him taking Britney Spears to the premiere. Yes. Yeah. I also had um, phone booth, I believe. Yeah, phone booth was in April. Saw that in uh, the theater. Old school. Old school is February. absolutely fantastic movie. Mm-hmm. Um, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, one of my faves. Frost Another Fall. great movie. Um, And love love all the Knicks and Kings games mm-hmm. in the movie. And I, you, I definitely watched Kate Hudson and Matthew McConaughey's Instagram Live reunion earlier this year. Sure you did. <laughs> for the 20th anniversary. <laughs> um, Daredevil, Ben Affleck as Daredevil. Yeah, that was a bad movie. Colin Farrell as well as Bullseye. Who's trying. And Jennifer Garner as Electra, And then she did Electra. And then we had the uh, great, I believe, Dinner for Five uh, when Ben and Jen are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with John like, Favreau. With John Favreau. Great show. I love that show. Yeah. Dinner for Five. Yeah. And that was the, the, the Daredevil one was Ben, Jen, Colin, Kevin Smith, I believe. Mm-hmm. And uh, that if you there that went viral when they were, were like, oh, look at them, Ben and Jen falling in love. But you could like see Jennifer Garner being like, wow, Ben Affleck is so great. Uh, in in real time in that in that yeah that. I mean like I I do believe that he, like you you can tell her like I mean that time like they were also going to like Red Sox games and everything you know a lot of high profile coverage yeah so yeah you could tell she was like falling in love with him yeah. uh, but you know they were already in Pearl Harbor together anyway True. so um the life of David Gale I saw this um at another sleepover with my friends wow, why <laughs> I don't know. My friend just rented it. And like, we just watched weird movies. Like, you know, Mulholland Drive, Life of David Gale, Kevin Spacey. Sure. Um, Cradle to the Grave, another DMX joint, RIP. Agent Cody Banks. Yeah, not a fan. Didn't see Um, it. Bend it like Beckham. The word of mouth hit. Great film. What a Girl Wants. Great Amanda Bynes and Mm -hmm. Colin Firth performances. Yep. Um, A Mighty Win. Yep. Mm -hmm. And Holes, Shia LaBeouf. Yeah, this is a good year. I actually think this is like a really good year. Compare it, like there's a lot of movies. Another one we didn't mention that has obviously grown to cult acclaim on a flag was The Room, which I never saw at the time. The Tommy we I saw. didn't see it at the time. Yeah. But I've seen it since, obviously. Yeah. Uh, no, this is a good year. Like this is like a lot of the like, the big movies are okay, not great, but some of them are great like Pirates and Bad Boys 2. And then a lot of these little movies that are really good. I don't know. Um. Yeah, oh, I, oh, I also watch Identity which was not really that great, but that was like an adaptation of Ben Ben Never Non. Yes. Ray Liotta, John Cusack. Yeah. Oh yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Uh, I think that was James Mangold, right? Indiana Jones director, James Mangold. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And also um, Amanda Peet. 
Yes. Yeah. And now for Molina. Yeah. So that's how we get into the Oscars. So like I said, I, if I'm ranking these last three years, the Lord of the Rings years, I would do this one, and then 2001, and then 2002. You mean like in terms of what's the, the better films. movie? In, in film, not just Lord of the Rings movies. I'm, I'm just saying like in general, this era that we've done of these three Oscars. I feel like this is a good year compared to the other ones. Um, yeah, I would do 2001 last. I feel like 2003 and 2002 are kind of even for me. The one thing I will say about 2003 compared to 2002 is I think 2003 is like deeper. Like I said, there's like a lot of movies here, but 2002 had the best movies because it's like Catch Me If You Can is probably like a really is like maybe the best. 2002 movie. had Eight Mile, so an Eight Mile, so uh, they'll kill Bill probably a close second. So the ceremony, so like we said, the previous year, uh, bad ratings and everybody was pressed. So we're getting Billy back. To help save save the day and write the ship. Uh, Connery comes out to open the show. And he has just an absurd intro that I was just like, I wrote down some of it. I was like, why is this? I, I just couldn't figure out like what this was, why this is, how they think this is going to help people want to watch it. Connery comes out, gets applause. They are, are more, movies are more than just an entertainment. They're the force that binds us together. The common link that touches the humanity of us all. That's why we love to watch the movies. So tonight... Our Academy invites the world to celebrate the magic of going to the movies. Enjoy. Is this the Nicole Kim and AMC ad, but earlier? Yeah, but at the time, I remember, I mean, obviously, they could have just started with the, the montage of Billy inserting himself into movies. Sure. But at the time, I, I was like, oh, they're doing this because um, obviously the year is 2004. We're coming up on another election. It was primary season. It's like very contentious and I kind of feel like they just brought him out this icon James Bond um you know super regal to kind of like you know just be like oh tonight is an, uh, the night to like allay you know all these other you know like politics and bitterness or whatever and just enjoy the movies like that was my read of it back then <laughs> I mean probably right I don't know I was just like it just is it yeah because they like totally so could have just launched into the montage right like it felt like also there. trying to capture like a stolen valor from the great tom cruise after 9-11 one pull up a couch it's oscar night yeah but like, i mean like the tom cruise one made sense you know and um like yeah this one was just unnecessary but i do think like it was just kind of like oh like you know for three at what how long was it three hours 45 minutes yeah so it's even longer than last year's, right? It was 15 minutes longer than the previous year. Yeah. But not the so, longest ever, obviously, which was 2002. Yeah. But, uh, so, so then Billy comes out. It's a... Uh... Well, no, it's a montage first. Well, yeah. Then Billy comes out and does the song. The montage uh, he... has, has the, the line of him talking to, what was it, like Gollum, right? And then mm -hmm. they're talking about like orcs. And then mm -hmm. he's like, oh, I thought it was just the Weinstein brothers. <laughs> The, the, is a trailer for the return of the host so good uh he says i first hosted the show 13 years ago things were so different then you know how different it was bush was a president the economy was tanking and we just finished a war with iraq big applause you know it was an easy layup but still good there's johnny depp the sexiest man alive i wrote that one down um he was yes he was the sexiest man of 2003 uh, Lord of the Rings, great night. 11 nominations, one for each ending. That's a good joke. It's a good, good joke. Yeah, that was interminable. Like I saw Return of the King with my parents and my dad after we got out. He was like, I was ready to get up like 17 times. <laughs> <laughs> but Billy does his, his typical uh, song and dance. I'm going to say we've seen Billy be more offensive, but this was still kind of offensive, I would say, watching the songs. Because he's doing like, like, uh, Sammy Davis, not Sammy Davis voice, maybe like Al Jolson. I don't even know what voice he's doing. Like Louis Armstrong voice, I guess, at some point. Just don't do whatever the voice is. It was like, should not be coming out of his mouth. That was well, my So take. he did, so he did Mystic River to Old Man River. Yes. Lost in Translation to Maria. Yes, that was cute. Yeah. Uh, Lord of the Rings to My Favorite Things. Really? He, apo he apologized to Julie Andrews first. Really good. He had a line in there. Uh, where was it? I got to find it. Oh, you, I missed. Oh, it was. Uh, the, the, these are a few of my favorite things. And he mentioned the Janet Jackson. Uh, this is right after Janet Jackson. Justin yeah. This, so that was the other thing about this ceremony. 
Um, it, it was on a it was on a five second tape delay. Yes, because of Nipplegate. And in the in the in the my favorite things thing, he goes Frodo and Sam on a mystical planet. Then Smeagol pops out like the right boob of Janet. You know what? That that would uh, not go over well today. I'm gonna say no. <laughs> um, and then he did Seed Biscuit to Goldfinger. Yeah. And Master and Commander to come fly with me. Yeah, gotta end with Frank, he says. Yeah. And everybody everybody loves it. The whole Mystic River one is funny, I think, in there because he's like singing to Clint about how old he is. And Clint, you know, still popping them out. It was amazing to me. He's like, Clint, most people your age would be dead or retired and you're still making movies. And I was like, this is 20 years ago and Clint still making another still movie doing it. <laughs> right now. He's doing Turning Journal number out. two or whatever. You know, Marty takes like three years to make a movie. Clint is like, give me eight months. This was a great year for, this was like, I feel like Clint is like, I mean, how many, like a cat. He's got like nine lives, right? So this was like a real, I feel like this was like the re-rebound re, re of like his previous comeback, right? He had Unforgiven. It was like Clint's back, right? Like blah, blah, blah. Then he had a bunch of like programmer movies, basically like the just genre movies that are just like kind of fine that maybe people like look better at now, like blood work, right? Or like, you know, whatever they were. And then uh, like- Space Cowboys. Space Cowboys, like all these like August uh, releases that were guaranteed to be like, the grownups are going to the movies, but then Mystic River launched him obviously into like Oscar re Oscar yeah, era. Because this this year, two thousand four, he'll have a million dollar baby coming out at the end of the year, and that that wins obviously. And so like, this was a great year for like, hey, Clint's back, another Clint's back. Clint's always back. It feels like he's like he, Ben Affleck. He's never been he's gone. Back. He's yeah. never been gone. He's always on a comeback. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that was, and then. I guess that was it. Then that was that's the end of Billy's monologue. I, I just thought it was like pretty fine. Like we've seen a lot of Billy ones. Yeah, he there. just he didn't do anything new. No. So it, it kind of felt a little rote and also just like Billy yeah. like kind of like flipping through just to get it over with, right? Like I'm back. Let's do it. I'm gonna get you. So you guys, you know, I thought I was out. You pull me back in. Fine, I'll just do my greatest hits. Right. Yeah. Uh so then we could do right I guess we'll go we'll do the categories like we usually do. Uh Though I will say, like, we have other big, big fun- I, I wrote down a few other funny Billy things that we could do as we get through the categories. But best picture, Joyce. I don't know if you know this. Lord of the Rings wins. Return of the King. The uh, other nominees were Lost of Translation, Master and Commander, Mystic River, and Seabiscuit. Yeah. You know, congratulations to New Zealand. So, so uh, Lord of the Rings obviously went for 11 for 11. Master and Commander had 10 nominations. Mm-hmm. I think Mystic River was still the runner up, though. I don't know. I, I kind of felt like it would have been if it wasn't for Lord yeah. of the Rings. I mean, My- Mystic River, Mystic River, and Master and Commander are the only two other films that won multiple Oscars. Yes. So, both won two. Yes. And Mystic River obviously won both male acting categories. Now, Mystic River only had six nominations. It got picture, director, adapted screenplay. Yeah, because it's not a tech movie like Master and Commander. It's not a tech movie, but I feel like it left numerous nominations on the board that i was like when i was watching it again and this is like again recency bias of the highest order but i was like cinematography and specifically editing i was kind of surprised it didn't make it in because the editing of it is like incredibly good and i feel like the storytelling that clint's able to do and like kind of like the cross cutting of the whole thing and especially in the third act is like awesome but the nominees for editing were like really solid too it's like city of god and walter merch for cold mountain Master Commander, Sea Biscuit, and Lord of the Rings. So I'm like, I could see it missing, but I feel like it did leave nominations on the table. But anyway, I still think it would have been the runner up. That's a long way. Yeah, it was definitely the runner up. Um, yeah, the, I I don't really have a problem with the editing nominations. Like City of God did really well. Yeah. Um, so I don't begrudge that nomination. Like that's a deserved nomination, I guess. You would just say it would have replaced Cole Mountain. Probably. Um, because so you know, these five are pretty solid five, I think. And all probably pretty deserved. They're all actually good movies. Sea Biscuit's like my least favorite, but even and I haven't seen it again. But I was like, it was good. Yeah, that was that was the, you know, like that would that would have that was like the film Twitter favorite back then, right? You know, that was like what people were rooting for. Pretty funny that that was the film Twitter favorite back then. Imagine now, you know, because I I like, I mean, I know like the actual movie itself, it's like too broad to be a film Twitter favorite, but that was like the vibe of like just people kind of championing it. Right. You know, it's like, I mean, more of the support of outsiders wanting it to get in than the actual movie itself. Um, but uh, yeah, that like that is probably what 
pushed out Colt Mountain. Colt Mountain was like, you know, Harvey's big thing this year. It got eight Golden Globe nominations. <laughs> um, and it got into BAFTA. So it it just missed here it, probably. It was and, definitely six, I would argue. And um, so it it ended Miramax's streak of uh, a best picture nominee since the crying game so 11 years so then after nominations harvey did a, a bunch of interviews as yes. he's wanted to do tell, tell me more so his his spin on this was that you know it was just like the the truncated calendar they were a victim of it because um cole mountain came out at the end of december like it was like a christmas release so um like they they now need to you know rethink like their release strategies for future films so he like a bunch of interviews he, he talks about the aviator and stuff but so there's a, an extended interview with him on salon um like two days after nominations the headline is harvey colon happy question mark what a headline yeah great so i mean the first part of the interview is about city of god so that's the other part of it so he spends a, he he still considers this a win because he was backing City of God for right. a whole year. Right. He got in because it was eligible for foreign language film the year before it didn't get in. Um, and now, you know, it got a director nomination and everything. So he was very pleased about that. And then here it's like, oh, so they shift to Cole Mountain. So uh, what was your reaction to the snub? Uh he says, you can't call it a snub. What happened was Miramax led the Academy with the most nominations of any studio. Warner Brothers was second with 11. Um, Miramax had 15. And, uh, so there's no Miramax snub. You know, people feel a certain way about a movie. There were five great movies nominated. Let's not take away their power. If there was a Miramax snub, Miramax would have had no nominations. It certainly wouldn't have dominated and we dominated. I mean, we are the most nominated studio. If you count Master and Commander with our 15, because that was a co-production, we it's 25. And we've dominated year after year with the most nominations and most best picture wins. But this year we got our strategy wrong because every year we always try to take that Christmas release slot, go last because in January, February, and March, a movie has less competition at the box office. This year with the shortened release schedule, uh, bleh, we said, you know what, we'll overcome that. And I don't think we were, we were able to do that. The movies that got nominated were Skid, which was released in August. Number two, Lost in Translation, released in September. Number three, Mystic River, released in October. Number four, Master and Commander, uh, November. And the last movie, but the last day was Lord of the Rings, uh, December 17th. And I believe there have been two other Lord of the Rings, you know. So no movie after that date. And let's face it, Lord of the Rings in three days outgrows every other movie combined. You know, it was that big. So you have the situation where the early, early campaign this year really, really hurt us. But each category votes individually. So if you got lucky and enough music people saw your movies, you get music nominations like we did. If you get lucky, the editors see your movies and you get an editing nomination. But on Best Picture, you must have everybody see your movie. And I don't think we had it. I just don't think we had it. Uh, I just don't think we were able to get the movie out to as many people as we needed to see it before voting closed. And that's because the schedule got reduced by two weeks of voting. Last year, you had the Golden Globes and everybody would watch that. And then they'd watch their movies. They'd screen them. This year, so many people tell me anecdotally that they hadn't seen the film. They just didn't have a chance over Christmas. Therefore, they don't see it. They don't vote. And that's the end for us. So it makes me laugh because in an interview that he did before the release, this is in the Times on like December 17th. So like right around the release, he's again already priming the pump for not the, the movie is mid i would argue i don't yeah, think it's, it, a great it's movie. like totally average like that's the thing is that it's not a great movie it's a good movie i think it's totally fine like i remember watching at the time and i do love renee zellweger in it and there's a lot to like like about it but mid movie certainly not as good as like chicago or as embraced as chicago i don't know if chicago is a great movie either but at least like you know what i mean but so in this article in the times uh how well the movie is received mr minhel minhel said uh will depend on if people are really ready, ready to revisit the film. And then Harvey basically saying like the same thing, like we want uh, the Oscar voters to have seen it twice. Like a lot of people see it twice kind of thing. And I'm like, okay, 
Well, they didn't get to see it twice. But in this one, he's to you like, oh, well, you know, they just didn't get to see it. Like, well, maybe they saw it and didn't like it. Also possible. Um, Yeah. I mean, I think if, if it were a field of 10, it, it would have gotten in, you know? I am definitely thinking about oh. it. I have I have both Cold Mountain and City of God on my my second tier. Oh yeah, City of God for sure. Um, but yeah, I think there's just not that much passion for no. it, you know. Us and like Nicole didn't get in either right. to Best Actress. Um, so this is an, a, another interview that he did at Post Noms with Time Magazine. It's called 10 Questions for Harvey Weinstein. So we basically reiterated the same thing about the early voting and the shortened calendar. So then they ask him, are you going to rejigger release dates for Oscar-worthy movies this year as a result? And he said, I just moved J.M. Barry's Neverland, which became Finding Neverland, with Johnny Depp to October with Martin Scorsese's The Aviator, which we talked about for Christmas release. We're going to see if you could push that to November. But that was, it was still a December release. <laughs> amazing and it got nominated so i will say like later though we've seen him he does uh, we'll we'll get to these like i guess we won't get to these because we're not going to do the the 2010s uh maybe next season but like the artist and uh king's speech are like november releases so maybe he did adjust obviously well i mean i think like everyone did eventually it wasn't just him and i think it, it became more about the festival circuit right with the shortened calendar that's where a lot of um smaller films especially launched yeah and um you know you have to like kind of take them out to like test the waters a little bit we see that now we're gonna see that soon a lot of small movies last year at this time we were like man bardo is gonna be great can't wait to see that at the festivals and then he went back to the editing room and i think 20 minutes yeah uh so the top five like we said lord of the rings lost Trans- master commander mystic river and sea biscuit i thought cold mountain and city of god would have gotten in if it was a field of 10 i had mm-hmm. pirates of the caribbean in there um i would love to see it but i feel like finding nemo probably i had would... i had finding nemo too i had both of them in there um yeah and, and then, then my last one was the barbarian invasions i feel like that would be like a number 10 yes i have it literally at 10 it's the that that was it and then i don't know i, I couldn't really think of anything else that would get in i had like in a as like the like indie thing and also american splendor the americas either one those of those are, those are like like the the critic faves that right. would probably get in now yeah. yeah and i mean in america had an acting nomination so um yeah it this was pretty top heavy yeah the other ones i wrote down were movies that would have never gotten in like kill bill i mean i would have put that in but it's not going to get nominated obviously i also wrote down like bended like beckham but i don't think it would have happened but that's a movie that everybody likes at least yeah nowadays Um, it actually might happen i don't know you could see it depending on the but like back then it was like no and then i also feel like at the time there were you know again high expectations for last samurai and that did not pan out that was another flop not yeah. a bad movie, but just like an awards flop. This had yeah. Oscar buzz, even though it got Oscar nominations, obviously. Yeah. Uh, best director, uh, Peter Jackson wins, wins for Lord of the Rings Return of the King. They finally gave it to him. After snubbing him the year before, because they knew we were going to give it to him this year. Uh, Fernando Marielis for City of God. Sofia Coppola for Lost in Translation. The first American woman nominated for best director, as they say in the ceremony. Or as Bill Murray later says, uh, first American girl. Uh, Peter Weir, Master and Commander and clint for mystic river really good list of nominees here uh obviously peter jackson was going to win like we said nothing they were not going to lose a thing the whole night it was totally uh chalk not unexpected i think clint is like a runner-up but maybe you know i can make the case for sophia or peter weir or Um, i think it was clint (laughs) yeah i think i think it was just like we're gonna give sophia it was like in one of the cases where she's not gonna win director she's gonna win screenplay right and Clint, we're going to give next year anyway, so it's fine. I, I mean, they didn't know that, but it was like, there was just no way he was going to be Peter Jackson, no. you know? No. So obviously the snub here from, from Best Picture is Gary Ross for Seed This Kid. Yes. Um, I don't think he was close. Not even close. I mean, I think Anthony Minghello was sixth. Um, Probably. Um, So at DGA, 
it was like Gary got into DJ. Yes. It was Peter, Sophia, Clint, Gary, uh, and Peter Weir. Yes. So that's also not that surprising because you know, as we know, DJ is a lot more broad. Gary's the joke of Kaczynski of, of this race. Um and yeah, like Anthony Mangella got in at BAFTA, but that's also not surprising, you know. Um, and Tim Burton also got into at BAFTA for a I actually think Tim Burton was again over Gary Ross as well. I just don't think Gary Ross, it was like kind of like the movie, not not thought of as like a directorial movie for some reason. Yeah. Um, I also wrote down um Jim Sheridan for In America. Good one. Yeah. I feel like uh, that's definitely something that could have happened now. Yes. The other ones I wrote down, and I think now would be more obviously likely than they were then, would be like Patty Jenkins for Monster. She and... definitely would have gotten a lot more play if that movie came out now. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I feel like back then, the entire narrative around that film was just Charlize. Yes. And yeah. uh, Nikki Caro for Whale Rider, another one I think would have gotten yeah. more play now. And Alejandro Iñárritu for 21 Grams seemingly mm-hmm. would have gotten a lot more play now. Yeah. Uh, and I have Denny Zarkan for uh, Barbarian Invasions. Uh-huh. Yeah. But... None of these people would have gotten nominated, though. <laughs> so, no. Like, why? Yeah. And, like, I, I don't even think, like, uh, Fernando was that surprising. No. It didn't feel like a surprise at all, either. Yeah. It, it, Gary Ross would have felt like a surprise even then. Yeah, that would have just been like, wow, they really love Sea Biscuit. <laughs> yeah. Um, for Best Actor, Joyce, this was the contentious race. Yes, but in the end, uh, went the way I expected. So Sean Penn wins for Mystic River. Mm-hmm. The other nominees are Johnny Depp for Pirates of the Caribbean. A first nomination for Johnny Depp. Everybody was like thrilled. This was like the year of Johnny Depp and like- Sexy Hollywood, Man Alive. Sexy Man Alive, Hollywood's bad boy makes good, right? Like it's like kind of like the Robert Downey Jr. Iron Man narrative before Robert Downey and, Jr. And look at Johnny Depp now. Uh, ben Kingsley for The House of Sand and Fog, a movie I saw in the theater and was bored stiff by, but I was younger and maybe it's better now. I don't know. I'm ready. I'm happy to be my blind spots. Uh, Jude Law for Cold Mountain. Uh, just a forgettable performance in my mind. I don't know. I don't really think about it all. Um, Just like totally fine. I just like, I, again, I haven't seen that movie in 20 years, so. And then Bill Murray for Lost in Translation. So Bill Murray basically expected to win himself the entire uh, season. He won uh, a lot, but not as much as maybe you remember because he lo- he won he won at the Globes and he won at the BAFTA Awards. But he well, did not he won win the Globe in a separate category because he was in comedy Correct. and Sean Penn won in drama. <laughs> and then Sean Penn won Critics Choice Awards and Johnny Depp won at SAG, which that felt like a, a place that was great where Bill should win, right? You would think. Yeah, but also not surprising because, you know, SAG, again, very broad, mainstream. Yes. Um, I remember that ceremony, though, because it aired on the same night as the Sex and the City series finale. So this the season was like a testy one for me because it was my it was my freshman year of college. So I was like, I'm going to have to watch these award shows with other people like my roommate and stuff. And I don't know, like. <laughs> And you know me, I, I don't like watching these things with other people because I don't like commentary during the show. Right. I don't like people talking. So the January was fine because we were still on winter break, but this was like SAGs, February. And so the good thing about the SAGs was that basically everybody on my dorm floor wanted to watch the Sex and the City series finale. So they were all just like in other people's rooms, you know, watching it. And I was like, I can watch the SAG Awards by myself. <laughs> in peace and quiet and then that was a great upset win for johnny depp so i'm glad he got something for that performance it's a great performance he he would definitely be you know the people's choice for the oscar win um and yeah he injected um kind of like a, a last minute like dark horse momentum into the race but i don't think he was really that close to upsetting he was never like going to be an adrian brody here it was always between sean and bill and i think it was just like sean's time like he's obviously very well respected and revered as an actor regardless of what you personally think of him but like in the community obviously you could tell they really respect him he got a standing o right i mean it's so uh, it was one of those things that at the time i think it was you it was an upset at the time, maybe, but like we said, not really, if you're paying attention, but I mean, he gets an immediate uproarious standing ovation. And then he and also had 21 grams that year. And it's just like, 
no kidding he won like it's one of those it was like billy bob winning for a screenplay right when it was just like everybody loves uh sean penn here it was like a huge win for sean penn the performance i haven't rewatched it he's great in the movie he actually is great in mystic river it's not as much of a lead as like bill is because he's it, mystic river is certainly like more of an ensemble but like man sean penn's like really good in it and like it's a probably like he was right to win for this yeah, he was, um, because you can't be double nominated at the Oscars, but he was double nominated at BAFTA for Mystic River and 21 Grams. And then it was like everyone, there was, I never felt like, you know, sometimes now when people have like two films in the running in the same acting category, it never felt like there was any conflict here between the two of them. It was like Mystic River was obviously going to be his Oscar push, right. not 21 Grams, you know, and it was- it was also like the the dram- the dramatic performance for better or worse like we just know they prefer drama to comedic performances which both Johnny's and Bill's were like Bill is not like haha like comedy but you know it it's also a more minimalistic performance like there's a lot of subtlety to it and i think that doesn't catch the average voter you know and- it's not it's not as over to the average right. voter and so. and clearly Mystic River was a more popular movie of the yeah. two, Bill Murray in the in, in in after the loss obviously looked he looked not happy. He yeah, I and, mean like you can see it in like just watch the video. <laughs> and then uh, I believe Billy's like, "Don't go, Bill. We all love you." And that was another thing where people were like kind of annoyed that Billy would do that because they thought it was like an embarrassment for Bill to be told that don't leave, even though this was one of the last awards of the night. Where's he going to go? He's just going to sit there like a schmuck and then go. He can go to the bar. Uh, in the in the years since, uh, Bill has like said some quotes that I'm like, again, a little bit of revisionist history if you kind of like believe, print the legend. But he was like, this was the, uh, to the Associated Press after the loss. You can't get all ramped up and amped up about this thing all the time. I mean, I got excited about it once and it was odd. I won all the prizes. I won literally all the prizes all the way up to the last one. Might want to check the literally definition on that one, bud. And I really thought, well, I've got this thing. I'm going to go get this thing and I'll be right back. And then I didn't win. And I thought, well, that's odd. How is odd is that? I'm feeling odd now. And then later in 2014, he said, six months later, I realized I had taken the virus. I had been infected. Uh, He said some of the careers of his peers have faltered because of the golden statue. People have this post-Oscar blowback, he says. They start thinking, I can't do a movie unless it's Oscar-worthy. It just seems people have difficulty making the right choices after that. He said that in 2014 in a variety piece about the unforgettable movie uh, St. Vincent. Sure. At the um, time, I was definitely mad that Bill Murray lost because I love yeah. Bill Murray. Well, and I, I, I think he did. Everybody. I think he had, he had a lot of probably acting support but like within the broad at the time 6,000 member of the academy with everyone voting for the winners he probably did not or like I also he really did not since he lost it's certainly and I mean like obviously now Bill Murray has been the more of a focus on his onset behavior certainly in the last like year but I mean he is a historic often jerk on set like celebrated as such right like where it was like uh, in the SNL, like medium talent with Chevy Chase, like he's a combative presence on movies, certainly, uh, and has been, and again, celebrated as that for a long time. So I feel like that also maybe did not engender him goodwill in the community compared to Sean Penn, who, right, whatever, again, another person who, like you said, like people probably have differing opinions about, but I mean, I think in the community, yeah, and he's he just, I feel like considered. Sean, I mean, obviously, Bill, like he, he missed for Rushmore, right? That was like his first, like, real, like, critical yes. thing. Um, so maybe he also kind of felt like oh i missed for that i I got in for this so like this is also like my time right i, I think you I, could argue it was but but not i think it's much... also like more of sean penn's time too. it was and i will also say like again i love lots of translation but bill murray in rushmore i think is like his peak performance so it's like yeah. it would not have been his best performance to have won uh but it's still a great performance it's like yeah. i said this category though I, i'm like all respect to ben kingsley and jude law but I would boot them right the hell out. And they I were would, just killer noms. So uh, Russell Crowe and Peter Dinklage seemingly had staked claims to these nominations. Otherwise, probably Peter Dinklage got the SAG nominations. A station agent was big at SAG, um, and yeah, um, I think like now, like he probably would have gotten a bigger push 
yeah, now definitely. he probably would have picked up a lot of those you know like random critics awards too um especially you know like post game of thrones yes. you know? I, I think he would have gotten in over like jude law for sure and uh russell was seen as a snub but i feel like they were just over him by this point. i mean he has not made it back in since a beautiful mind i i totally agree it felt like it feels like the tom hanks thing where it's like we got it we yeah and it. then he he would have cinderella man the following year in 2005 and right nope. so uh but like i said earlier the people i would have absolutely nominated are like jack black and will ferrell i, I mean i think will ferrell's performance is like like a yeah, win there's a lot win. of great comedic performances that could have gotten in um yeah billy bob too for bat santa billy bob would also be on my list i just i'm like well Fer- i like really think will ferrell if i was it was will ferrell over sean penn i still think i might go will ferrell to win it's like one of the greatest comedic performances i've ever seen he's so funny in it and it's like playing that kind of like naivete in such an earnest fashion i think is like really good it's just he's so good in it um i also um put down chodo edgia for for dirty pretty things mm-hmm. yeah so that it would never would have happened. No, but that's a good performance, which I didn't see until like years later. Let me ask you this: So obviously, Lord of the Rings goes eleven for eleven. Viggo Mortensen push for best actor. It, that was never happening. But like the the acting push for Lord of the Rings this year was Sean Astin. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I kind of maybe would have nominated Viggo too. I don't know. I don't know how you put him in, but I'm like, he is great in Lord of the Rings: Return of the King. He is, but it was you know he got no acting nominations. No. For, yeah. Another reason why I think 11 for 11 with no act nomination would never happen again. Uh, Best Actress, as predicted by Bill Simmons the previous year in his very sexist uh, page two column, uh, Charlie Theron de-glamming uh, to play a serial killer monster wins Best Actress. And the other she nominees to thank all of South Africa. So. Yes. The other nominees are Keisha Castle used for The Whale Rider, Diane Keaton for Something's Gotta Give, Samantha Morton for In America, and Naomi Watts for 21 Grams. Yeah. Um, so at the time, Keisha Castle Hughes, uh, became at 13 years old, the then youngest best actress nominee. Soon, soon usurped by Kwavanjane Wallace. Yeah, a little cute. Um, but remember she was campaigned and supporting and she got the SAG nom in supporting mm-hmm. just because she was a child. Yes. And it's like, who the fuck is she supporting? Right. The whale. Her, yeah. Yeah. Um, Samantha Morton, it feels like a great nomination for In America, and I think helped that the previous year for Minority Report, she was at least discussed maybe for a nomination, like as on the come up. Um, but also a former nominee. Yeah. So Naomi Watts, 21 Grams, like we said, that's like an actor's movie. Also kind of like a makeup for Mulholland Drive as well. Um, uh, and then Diane, like a comeback nom. Sure. Mm-hmm. People I wrote down that I felt like should have gotten in were definitely Scarlett Johansson for Lost in Translation. Who got yeah, done so does. dirty? She on had, the show. Well, she had two films this year. Yeah, Girl with the Pearly Earring was the other one. Uh, it's done so dirty on the show that uh, she doesn't even get thanked in Sophia's speech. Sophia just kind of forgets all about her. Um, she she did get to present though. So she did. She had a great. She was so funny presenting. I just love Scarlett Johansson. I always loved her so much, and I think she's so funny. And she has a great deadpan line. She's doing like makeup, and she's like, "I've been wearing makeup for thirty five years, and no one laughs." <laughs> so good <laughs> um she did she did win the bafta she was double nommed at bafta for both so she overcame her own vote split she's she wonderful i think in in lost in translation it was like it's like a great, yeah. great it kind of it sucks that it it she had to wait so long to finally yeah. get yeah. A, a nomination like and she got two in one year yeah um but yeah Indeed. she should have gotten her first one yeah. for this i and think so too I, there was also like um confusion at the time or like debate about like where she should be and obviously oscar voters can nominate you whatever category you want right. to right so, uh I, w- I wrote down patricia clarkson for the station agent as another potential nominee here um yeah uh patty uh was great and she would get um uh, or i like it was like a makeup from like the previous year i felt like mm-hmm too it could have been um and then uh evan rachel wood for 13 i have that down too seemed like another person who yeah could that have was that was another big thing yeah that year uh um, holly hunter got in so i i wrote down obviously nicole kidman like we talked about for cold mountain so harvey has another quote um about cold mountains snubs 
So this Can't is wait. In, this is in um the observer. Uh -huh. Um the uh right right after or a couple days after Nam. So headline in Academy Race. Miramax chilled on Cold Mountain. Um, so they're talking about like Cold Mountain was supposed to be the new millennium's answer to Gone with the Wind. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> An epic Civil War drama that centered on a love story. The argument leading up to the nominations was not was not whether or not the film would be nominated, but whether or not it had a chance to dethrone the third installment of The Lord of the Rings which most pundits seem to think has the best shot to win the grand prize. With regard to Mr. Mangella and Miss Kidman, however, Miramax might have seen this coming. Harvey says, quote, I think there were some people who thought Nicole was glamorous in the movie, and yet she wasn't. Um, she was a great actress. That was the interpretation of the part. Some people didn't agree with it. Oh my god. Uh <laughs> sure. I, I mean, I just think they just didn't like the movie. They didn't like the movie, yeah. is what it was, I think too. Um other people I wrote down that I was like Kate Blanchett for Veronica Guerin. No, but no. Um Jamie Lee and Lindsay Lohan for Freaky Friday. Jamie Lee it's Jamie Lee got the, the Globe nom, obviously, because yeah. they love her there. Right. So she would have been a, a fun one, but obviously that was not gonna happen. And then my choice would be Uma Thurman for Kill Bill Volume One. Yeah, I wrote her down too. Obviously, not going to happen. Never. They didn't care about um, the movie. And then, did I have anyone else? This is, a, I mean, we've done years before where it's like, oh, I, I, have, I have Hope Davis for American Splendor. A good one. I also had Meg Ryan for In the Cut. Oh, we didn't even mention In the Cut. That was, I mean, now it's getting reappraised. Yes. A, a Jane Campion film. Uh, again, like high expectations for it, and it just got eviscerated. I, I think now it would not get eviscerated. And I think. No. Not now Meg Ryan maybe be in commerce. I, I just feel like a lot of years we have like a really tough time coming up with any alternates based on like what the roles are for women in Hollywood. But this year I feel like there's like there's like 15 potential nominees here. That would be really good. It's like a nice list. Yeah, there are a lot of options. It's just a lot of them are not in the the voters' wheelhouse of that time. And then Charlize went for Monster. I, I'm like, sure. I mean, I don't think that's a movie that like I really care to revisit. She's very good in the movie. It's, and... you know, D-Glam and uh, a real person. And yeah, yeah like I mean, a... she's, she's good in it. Um, classic Oscar bait. I have bait. not seen that in a while either. No, classic Oscar bait. Um, yeah, best and supporting... I, think, I think the good thing about it is that, you know, she was not like a one hit wonder or whatever like she's made it back like she made it back two years later for north country right and she should have made it back for Fat mad max Fury road uh but supporting actor Catherine Zeta jones comes out to do it and billy in, in in introduces her by saying the reason i bought 12 phones and i actually googled this because i was like what in the fuck yes. what ad was she doing and it's a t-mobile ad yeah Catherine don't you remember those oh i did God. not until i googled it so if you were watching this and like what the hell was that about that's what it was about uh supporting actor Goes to Tim Robbins for Mystic River. Uh, the other nominees are Alec Baldwin for The Cooler, uh, Benicio del Toro for Twenty One Grams, Jaiman Ansu for In America, and Ken Watanabe for The Last Samurai. Uh, it was done. Like one of the most locked ones. I feel like just a classic one. I watched it last night. Tim Robbins is really good yeah. in this. Uh, it is actually a good performance, and it's like a great classic supporting actor performance. He has like two or three like really banger scenes. Is like a tragic character. And like kind of like revolves around all the other characters. Um, so it's a no-brainer that he won. And this is a good list, but I came up with like a lot more, obviously. Well, he lost BAFTA. That was the only thing he lost to Bill Nye for Love Actually. So obviously Bill Nye. <laughs> so Bill Nye obviously should have gotten in as well. Though I love like Jaiman Hansu and Ken Watanabe and Benicio all getting in here. I feel like these are all like, like you were just saying with like Charlie's for North Country, like kind of nominations or Watanabe in, the, in this case, like his first. Um, the other person I thought of was Kevin Bacon for Mystic River, who got not a lot of shine. Yeah, yeah like paid dust. But holy cow, he's so good in it. And he's like really one of the emotional like uh centerpieces of the movie. Yeah. But his character. I just think he's like great in it. Obviously, he was not gonna get nominated, seemingly. Nobody cared, but it was just it the everything just revolved around in supporting actor around Tim. Yes. You know. Uh, um, it, it was like Kevin and Laura Lenny was like nothing for <laughs> them. Uh, 
and Laura Linney, I'll mention we do supporting actors. Uh, Sean Aston, like you mentioned, and Ian McKellen, I felt like for Return of the King could have just gotten in. Certainly, yeah, it sucks years. that he never made it back in after Fellowship. Um, I have down uh, my guy Paul Bettany from Master and Commander. Great, would have been great. So, yeah, um, he got in at BAFTA. Yep, I, I put down Chris Cooper for Sea Biscuit as like a okay. return nominee potential. Yeah, um, uh, uh, Albert Finney was a a popular prediction as well. For Big Fish. Yeah, for Big Fish. Yeah. A lot of these are the problem. Like, the Sea Biscuit, I think you have a problem where there's multiple people. Like, William H. Macy and Jeff yeah. Bridges could have gotten in, too, right? So, like, they're all going to not get in. Uh, for Even for Mystic River, Kevin Bacon and Lawrence Fishburne, I think, would have been, like, popular. Yeah, because Macy got in at the Globes. Yes. Um, the Globes also did Peter Sarsgaard for Shattered Glass. That was their yeah. big another good, Another good potential. Yeah. Uh, I wrote down uh, Hugh Grant for Love, actually. <laughs> Love a Minute. Great. Um, and, I have a Eugene Levy for A Mighty Wind. Great. That would have been a good one. And I have Keanu Reeves for Something's Gotta Give. Um, remember their reunion at the Oscars three years sure ago? Yeah. And then Diane like could not beat the winner. Parasite. <laughs> uh, this is a good, I mean, like, I think Tim Robbins is like a good winner. And it was like, uh, you know, like he's another person who felt like it was like, we should have him win an Oscar. And then we finally did. Yeah, I mean, he was previously nominated for directing *The Man Walking*. Right. Um, and yeah, it was just like it's like the right role, and it was Beatty. And then, like everyone was in agreement that it's like, yeah, we'll give it to you. Uh, supporting actress. Speaking of like, we're gonna give it to you. Renee Zellweger wins for *Cold Mountain*, her third not straight year with a nomination, and her first win here in the supporting actress category, not in lead actress category. Uh, other nominees were Shoya Ag 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 Agadashlu for *House of Santa Fog*, Patricia Clarkson for *Piece of April*, Marsha Gay Harden for *Mystic River*, and Holly Hunter for *Thirteen*. I gotta say, *Cold Mountain*, like I said, not a movie I really care that much about, but Renee Zellweger in *Cold Mountain*, the iconic. Every piece of this is man's bullshit. They call this war a cloud over the land, but they made the weather and they stand in the rain and say, shit, it's raining. That is like, win the Oscar. That that's that two sentences. The entire the performance is just bait. Just it's owning just so it. <laughs> uh, loved it so much. Um, yeah, I have, no, I have no qualms with this because like we were saying in the Chicago one, it just felt like we were just tracking to her winning something finally. And she did. I think Renee Zellweger is a great actress. Like I was glad she won. Well, there was even before the previous year's ceremony, it was like, we knew Cole Mountain was coming out and it was, cause that was the thing. It was like, oh, Cole Mountain has these two current Best Actress nominees in the same right. film. So they could be back here the next year. So then as soon as Renee lost, it was like, oh, she can win the next year for Cold Mountain. And she did. Yeah, it was just, you know, uh, we missed you the, the past two times. Here we go now. And yeah, she was the only sweeper this year. Uh, we're going to have a lot more just full sweeps starting with this year, obviously, because we lost a month. So, uh, yeah, she won everything. And then the, the only drama in this category was the ad that DreamWorks took out yes. to shill Sheree Agdashlu. And this came back around this past year because of Andrea Riseborough. And, yes. Um, the all all the two less or a, a two leslie instagram post from months prior but basically um in like during voting or like a or maybe like a week before voting dreamworks took out an fyc ad um and it pulled like critics picks or predictions for this category and it was four of them and in three of them it said that Renee Zellweger will win the Oscar, but Sheree Agdashli should win the Oscar. Mm -hmm. So this caused a whole dust up, especially because, you know, they tightened the rules from July, like in July 2003, after the Gangs of New York drama that we discussed last week <laughs> with the fake Robert Wise mm -hmm. op ed that was written by Miramax. And so this is a story. Uh, on February 24th, 2004, so five days before the ceremony. <laughs> and the headline is Ad Rocks Oscars Boat. 
Um, okay. So, uh, Bruce Davis, the Academy's executive director, quote, it's certainly a new and unwelcome step downward in campaigning. Um, he calls it an, an attack ad. Uh, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Uh, says He said he had spoken with several Oscar voters over the weekend who reacted to the ad, quote, with varying degrees of surprise and amazement. And then DreamWorks apologized for the advertisement, saying it was never intended as a criticism of either Zellweger or Film. Quote, the ad was a mistake. It shouldn't have happened, said studio co-founder Jeffrey Katzenberg. Quote, in a year in which everyone has pledged to take a higher road, we made a very bad and ill-advised mistake. Um, uh, as, as soon as the ad ran, Brant Joel, one of Zellweger's representatives at CAA, called both DreamWorks and the Academy to complain. Quote, clearly they were upset and said, is this fair, Davis said of Joel's call. Um, the ad falls into a gray area that is not expressly forbidden, but could be construed as violating the spirit of the Academy's new regulations, encouraging, quote, a high degree of fairness and dignity, end quote, during award season. Um, the House of Sand and Fog plug also appears to cross a line by referring to a rival nominee by name. Quote, that certainly hasn't happened in the most recent quarter century, Davis said amazing um over the past several years the typically bare knuckle oscar campaigns have become especially costly and bloody from off the record gossip attacking some nominees to swank dinner parties promoting others studios and their awards consultants have used nearly every tactic imaginable to secure both academy award nominations and win so they talk about like their new policy from july after gangs of new york um blah 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 so the academy has not shied away from harsh penalties in other cases and recently expelled a member veteran actor carmine caridi for allowing his academy's video video cassettes be copied illegally so they have yet to be determine a penalty against dreamworks zellweger um is aware of the ad and quote disappointed by it a spokeswoman said and uh, Oh, they talk about like how DreamWorks has a Shark Tale coming out in October and Renee is in that. Amazing. <laughs> and, uh, Terry Press, quote, we can be accused of stupidity, but not maliciousness. Oh my God. It's an ad promoting Sheree. We didn't take out an ad saying, quote, don't vote for Renee Zellweger. Well, we're in business for Renee Zellweger. Why would we do this? Added Michael London, who produced House of Sand and Fog, quote, with all the underhanded subterfuge, that goes on in awards campaigning. It's ironic that Academy is singling out something that is on the record and public. Amazing. I love this so love much. The spin. Love the spin. Nothing, also, nothing changes, obviously. Like no, you said, nothing. Like, we still have this, you know. Still happened. You could have just re replaced, find replace Shore for uh, for uh, Andrew Riseborough and nothing would have changed from those statements. Yeah, that, that, was, that was why it came back around this year. I was like, yeah. Uh, yeah. in her speech, Renee, I loved her speech. I thought she's like really genuine. But the thing that made me laugh is she thanks Nicole Kidman and they show Nicole Kidman. And then she goes, she thanks specifically Vincent D'Onofrio for teaching me how to work. And Tom Cruise for showing me that very early on kindness and success are not mutually exclusive. And they cut to Nicole Kidman. <laughs> Oh yeah, I remember that when it happened live. That's awesome. That is like awesome directing. Uh, win an Emmy for that. Let's do it. Uh, just great stuff. Um, and there we go. So then Renee won another, like we said, the supporting categories here were like good night delights, basically. Yeah. And it, it was, it, I, I feel like um, before she came back with Judy and one for Judy, um, there was this kind of sentiment that like, oh, they just took care of her then and like, right. she's never going to come back. I mean, like, I'm glad she came back and won for Judy. And I don't think Judy was a great movie or that that was a good year, certainly for for actress. But I'm like, she definitely could have. I mean, like, we've gone through these performances. Bridget Jones, Chicago, Jerry Maguire, this. These are great. Like, she's like, those Nurse are Betty. great performances. Nurse Betty, sure. I mean, like, she's a great actress. And like, I'm glad she has two Oscars. But like, Judy would not have been one of the ones I would have given her. No, more. it's also funny because she beat Charlize and ScarJo for yes. Judy. So. Uh, the only people I wrote down were Laura Linney for Mystic River, who has the one like Lady Macbeth scene at the very end of the movie, basically, and she's yes. like awesome in it. And then Ellen DeGeneres for Finding Nemo, who's amazing. It's like a transformative voice performance. Um, I also have Emma Thompson for Love Actually, yeah, great sure. performance. And she was, I remember this in the EW Oscars issue, 
she because they had like their little like personal fycs for each mm -hmm. category and their fyc for supporting actress was emma thompson and i'm like yes definitely. great performance love her so much and um i also have maria bello for the cooler who yeah. got a couple noms here and there but missed so uh we could quickly do the screenplay winners uh uh, uh sofia coppola wins for laws and translation like we said that's like the quintessential screenplay cool movie you're not gonna win anything else here's your screenplay oscar uh that we've seen in other cases like from like Jordan Peele and, and on and on. Uh, other nominees were Barbarian Invasion, 30 Pretty Things, Finding Nemo in America. Uh, good list. I don't know. I, I would have put Elf in here and maybe Bad Santa. Um, yeah. Uh, this Yeah, this is, I don't really have a problem with no. this list overall. Um, I uh, have down Bend It Like Beckham. Sure. I also thought um, maybe uh, station agent. Yeah, station agent. Uh, that too. Um, I also wrote down love actually. <laughs> Why not, Richard Curtis? Let's go, love it. <laughs> but it's also funny because so many films have tried to replicate that format. Yes. Post Badly. Yeah. Badly. Uh, yeah. An adapted screenplay with a little movie called The Lord of the Rings: The Return of the King. The other nominees are American Splendor, City of God, Mystic River, and Sea Biscuit. Yeah. Um, you know, I think American Splendor would have been a good winner too, but like none of these were ever winning. <laughs> none of these were ever winning. And the other only few things I wrote down for like nominees were like Master and Commander and Cold Mountain, but clearly not. Yeah, I also wrote down Big Fish. Yep. Um, and Girl with a Pearl Earring. Yep. I don't think they care about Girl at all. Um, Barely even thought of it. Yeah, but I like this, this list is good too. The the actual nominees. So like City of God, you know, another yeah. top no nomination um if the i feel like mystic river would have won without lord of the rings there i think that's true mystic river versus lord of the rings reminds me very much of la confidential versus titanic mm -hmm. i mean like and, the Saint brian yeah Dublin. <laughs> yeah and i think that if it was a different prop like if lord of the rings was like titanic and like the reason i also think like this this will never happen again is because whatever you think of ip now and like obviously like these Marvel, like Marvel, and it's everything is IP. But Lord of the Rings was like thought of as like real literature, I think. And even though well, it's like a yes. fantasy, yeah. But you know, I mean, now I don't even think it is. I don't think people think of Lord of the Rings as like real literature. The adaptation, like The Hobbit and the series, have like kind of like turned it into Marvel to me. I don't think they should have done the Hobbit trilogy. And, um, you know, they're trying to do the second age with the, the Amazon series, which sure, but. And, and then they're going to do another Lord of the Rings movie, it seems, like Warner Brothers is trying to mount. It's just like dipping too much back into well. Yeah. And it just like, I think it's like really kind of dulled the the fact that this was like serious, but like broad appealing because it's obviously like fantasy. Um, I don't know. I don't think it'll ever happen again. 11 for 11 is so nuts. I just couldn't, I can't believe that that, the wins it had, I mean, we could do these wins were. Uh, all of its it, wins. <laughs> all of its wins were uh, visual effects. No kidding. The other nominees were Master Commander and Pirates, no way. Film editing, which is rich considering it has 17 endings, uh, but it's still one against, like we said, City of God, Cold Mount, Master Commander, and Sea Biscuit. I do wonder in another year if Mystic River was in here. I think Mystic River could have won this, honestly. I really do. Like Walter Murch got nominated for Cold Mountain. Obviously, Walter Murch is a legend, but I would have knocked him out and put put in Mystic River. Well, yeah, but I don't think, like, are you saying this would have been it's one loss from 11 nominations i think you could have made the argument yes but i don't know i mean we don't know i don't it know just, it just like wouldn't happen like maybe it could have happened if the winner voting is just per branch but it's everyone voting i guess but like everyone to a person even on the show would acknowledge the movie's too long and like that always is a ding for editing it feels like even if it's not fair to be a ding for editing right like the action editing in lord of the rings is awesome like it should win but i think you could make the case that it would have lost like this is a bummer. Yeah, I don't I feel like it wasn't I feel like now like today like movies are like longer than ever and I feel like back then movies were not as long and that's it true. was like special so to speak. That's true. Where and this is like an event and you like understand going into it it's going to be long. Right. But like how long is it actually? <laughs> it might be shorter than like um, kills the flower moon to be honest. Yeah, probably um lord of the rings I, and i don't mean like the director's cut <laughs> no i know 
um, 201 minutes. So it's like almost three and a half, right? Yeah, that's still short. Of, I, I, Kill the yeah. Moon is 206 minutes, so. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, like, I remember watching it in the theater. Yeah. And, like, I know going into it, it's going to be long. Like, their previous movies were long. And, but it's, and, like, it has way too many endings. <laughs> the endings is why, why I feel like Fellowship is the better movie. I mean, the, I still think Fellowship is the best. I, yeah. I, my rank is Fellowship. I mean, I actually might do them in order. Like, Fellowship, Two Towers, and, and Return of the King would be my top three. <laughs> Um, they're all good i actually do like this franchise yeah i i love the series and not the hobbit i've never seen any of the hobbits not fuck, i don't fuck with the hobbit i saw I the hobbit the first one when the hdr remember that was like the thing we were doing and it looked awful and i was just like i can't watch this Sorry. well that was another thing where i'm just like i don't need you to do more of these yeah so i'm not touching you but but yeah i feel like it, like there's not as many like three hour movies as no there are now or movies over two hours long as there are now so i think there's more patience for it back then too and then it was just winning everything so So it also won costume design uh and makeup it also won so did not win did not even have a nomination for cinematography Mm -hmm. which is hilarious lost a master and Panther won that yeah um it won art direction obviously it won sound mixing did not have a sound editing nomination a master commander won that uh-huh. Then it won Best Original Score for Howard Shore. The other nominees there were Big Fish, Danny Elfman, Cold Mountain, Gabriel Yared, Finding Nemo, Thomas Newman, and House of Santa Fog, James Horner. Um, so, Pirates should have been nominated. Great, great score. And then Original Song, it wins Into the West for uh, Howard Shore again, Fran Walsh, and Annie Lennox, who gets to give a speech. The other nominees were Triples of Belleville, A Mighty Wind, Scarlet Tide from Cold Mountain. And you will I be... Yeah. And you will be ain't my true love from Cold Mountain. So Harvey got those song, that's the song. The, that was the sing song. Yes. Uh and then yeah. it didn't win it. Did it win anything else? We went through all the other ones. Adapted screenplay, obviously, and then picture and director. So that's its eleven wins. Yeah, so I missed out on two nominations. It's also funny because Fellowship won cinematography. I, I actually cannot figure out why it missed cinematography. I was looking at the list. The nominees were Master and Commander, Russell Boyd, who won, City of God, uh, Cesar Charlone, uh, Cold Mountain, John Zeal, Girl with a Pearl Earring, Eduardo Serra, and John Schwartzman for Seabiscuit. I mean, they didn't even nominate Two Towers the year before either, but I guess that's less surprising because they were just not high on Two Towers in general. Right. Um, but maybe they were just... They, they moved on and they just never went back. <laughs> I mean, pretty much probably like they're like, oh, we already did you this, gave you this award. So it's fine. Yeah, and too. sound editing, I'm also a little confused by. Um, It's only three nominations, not three nominees here. So I guess that yeah. probably plays into it. Yeah. And yeah, like if it was five, it would have for sure gotten in. Would it have won? Um, yes. Probably, well, probably. the two t- the year before <laughs> right it didn't i didn't think it got into um for fellowship did it? i don't think I don't no know. it didn't so pearl harbor that was two nominees right. pearl harbor and monsters inc right uh and there you go that's it so then and then at the end of the show uh anything else here that i want to go here let's see uh blake edwards i think gets the uh yeah from jim carrey from jim carrey jim carrey who does uh that, that's like a, a pretty offensive opening uh sequence i would say <laughs> another one and there was also a lot of a lot of uh, white men doing uh, racist voices in this ceremony. There's also earlier uh, Robin Williams does like puppeteers Billy to yeah, show the delay. Yeah, like very early in the opening. Yeah, or in the uh, beginning. And then later, Billy does a Robin Williams impression when he's going through what people are thinking that I found like pretty funny. Actually, his like impression of Robin was good. Well, well, that's just his like shtick that he just brought back. Yeah. Uh, they also did a tribute to Bob Hope, who had died the previous summer, I believe. Tom Hanks did that tribute. All right. And they also did um, Catherine Hepburn. And Julia Roberts, Roberts did that tribute. Yeah. Catherine Hepburn died the day I graduated high school. Because I, I went, so I had my graduation, and then I went to a party. And then I remember coming home, and I went online. And I was like, Catherine Hepburn dead in 96. I was wow. like, oh. Yeah. And we didn't do the really presenters there, but obviously, like, Cruz did director. Mm-hmm. With his Mission Impossible three hair, 
Yeah. Uh, Adrian Brody does best actress and references making out with Halle Berry to the point where he like sprays. But I know. And then when when he did that like back then, I was like, that's gross because there's a 13 year old girl here. And he's like, oh, win, don't... But that's still gross. <laughs> I think he said something like, I have a restraining order. Let me see what I wrote down. Uh, don't worry, they have me under a restraining order. Yeah. Not great. No. Nicole Kidman for actor and then Steven Spielberg uh, for best picture, Lord of the Rings. And then at the end of the show, they do something kind of fun. Uh, Billy invites all the winners back out and they open up the curtain and they're all there with their Oscars. I don't think they would do that again because it's a bad optics look, especially in a year like this where like it's all white people. It. So it, like it just doesn't, doesn't look great. It looks like a sorority rush kind of. They, they do that. I don't think they do it on the actual show at the Baptist, but after the show is over, they have all the winners take a group photo on the stage. Yeah, it was cute. I was just like, they would never do this again because the optics are awful. It would just go viral immediately. It's like, this yeah. is terrible. Yeah. Um, and the only other you, thing- You I could do it back then because there was no social media. Right, no, nobody cared about any of this yeah. stuff. Uh, and then the, the other the other thing I wrote down was Jack Black and Will Ferrell do a, a song parody of Get Off the Stage, mm-hmm. which is really fun, before Best Original Song. And there you go. And the reviews were fine. I mean, people seem to think Billy was okay. It was like typical Billy. Billy's back. Yeah um he didn't really do anything new like we said and just again brought out his greatest hits and nobody really mentioned anything political um fog of war wins so errol morris does kind of say like makes like a vague kind of like play towards like war is bad and republicans suck kind of and then billy's like one want to see his tax audit and everybody laughs and he's like scary times but it wasn't Um, like michael no no one was booed no, no Michael Moore style. No, no polemics up there. Um, and that's it. That was the, that's the 2004 Oscars race. So the the Lord of the Rings, the Return of the King. Yeah, and the Return of the Host. Uh, so we'll be back next week with the 2005 Oscars. Clint again. Clint Actual again. Actual hardware this time. Marty back. Marty back again. Um, no and- hardware. And Chris Rock with one of the greatest uh, opening monologues I think I've ever seen. I absolutely love his opening monologue here. It's so hilarious. This is also Hillary and Annette part two. So uh, this one I'm, I'm excited to d- dig into because I have not thought of this one in a long time. But uh, I haven't know. watched rewatched this one a lot either. I also would I almost refuse to rewatch Million Dollar Baby because I found it so incredibly sad. So I'm not going to go revisit that. But I might put Aviator on this week uh, to watch it. Oh my gosh. I, I can't really rewatch Aviator. I don't know. I'm just like not Way like we said last week, like this was like Marty Sweaty era. It was, but this actually holds up pretty watch. well. It's very sweaty, but it holds up really. The way of the future. Way of the future. Way of the future. Way of the future. Joyce, that is the way of the future is us doing this Oscar. So uh going back to the past. Oh. <laughs> back to the future. Back to the past. All right, I'll talk to you next week then. Bye. <laughs>